Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Nick Ragstell. I am the Associate Dean for the College of Sciences and Mathematics at Belmont University here in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, I'm reaching out to you. I, I know that this is going to um, the uh, Tennessee HOSA uh, state meeting. So uh, I'm excited to at least be able to virtually uh, reach out to you and uh, work with you <clears throat> and, and tell you really about that, all the things that we have here at Belmont uh, that can help you out, right? And there's, there's a number of things, um, not only in terms of facilities, but also in terms of the interactions with the faculty, especially uh, and the staff as we uh, work to help you get uh, to your ultimate goal, which uh, for the majority of you, not all of you, but a lot of you, uh, wanting to go to a graduate healthcare program. So without uh, any further ado, uh, let's go ahead and get started. What we're going to do is we are going to uh, talk about six factors that um, I've recognized, my, my faculty recognize as being important in terms of preparing you uh, to be a, a very strong applicant for um, graduate healthcare programs. It ranges, uh, some of them are very objective, some of them are very subjective, right? And we'll kind of work our way through those um, as well. Uh, in addition to those um, six factors, I do want to focus in on some of the things uh, that we have, some of the opportunities that we have in terms of research, uh, facilities in terms of our own cadaver lab, in, in terms of a, of a lot of things, things that uh, really truly do set us apart in terms of a liberal arts uh, university. Um, <clears throat> so again, let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to share my screen. I have a PowerPoint presentation uh, queued up for us. Well, if I can get this to work, there we go. We're going to start from the beginning. So pre-health at Belmont University. And again, what we're trying to do is we're trying to prepare you and get you ready for those graduate healthcare programs uh, by focusing uh, on a number of things. I, I, I truly believe that the graduate healthcare programs are, are looking at your um, application holistically. So it's not just about your GPA. It's not just about that aptitude test. It is truly uh, who you are and, and how you answer that question of why. You know, why, why do you want to go to a graduate healthcare program? It, it's, it's a long, expensive journey, uh, very, re very rewarding. But yeah, you know, why do you want to do it? And, and, and that's what these factors are going to talk about is and in, in, in focus in on how um, <clears throat> we help you prepare for all of this. So first of all, right, uh, two very objective things, um, <clears throat> both GPA and an aptitude test. A couple of things to say about that, right? I asked my students to shoot for a GPA that's at about a 3.5, right? If you put that in perspective, an A is a 4.0, an A minus is a 3.67, a B plus is a 3.33, right? So we're asking you to shoot for uh, B pluses and above. Obviously, the higher, the better, but a, a 3.5 is competitive, right? So that's what we're, what we're wanting you to aim for. <clears throat> now, a lot of schools, what they will do is they will look at your overall GPA. So that's all of your courses. And then they will look at your science and math GPA. So uh, again, about a 3.5 in both of those. Now, that being said, one of the things that you can do <clears throat> to really help you earn that really high GPA is to choose your major wisely. I don't want you to choose a major because you think it's what the grad school wants. Grad schools don't care. I've sent religion majors and poli sci majors and theater production majors to graduate healthcare programs, right? To medical schools and so on. So that tells me that the grad schools don't care what you major in. So that being said, what I want you to do, I'm gonna give you a little homework. I want you to look at your high school transcript and I want you to figure out what you enjoy studying, whether it's English or math or science or whatever it is. I want you to consider that, right? If, if it is science, it's a little difficult because we bounce you around in high school in the sciences. You know, you take biology, you take chemistry, you take physics, you take something else. And so at that point, if, you, if your answer is, I enjoy science, then I want you to start thinking about content, 
You know, did you enjoy genetics? Did you enjoy thermodynamics? Did you enjoy, you know, uh, um, <clears throat> different physics, uh, um, circuitry or wave uh, physics, that type of thing? Think about what that is. And then that's probably telling you what to major in. Now, at Belmont, right, the College of Science and Math, right, CSM, we have a very, very good setup in terms of uh, helping you or, or providing a space that you can space that you can learn in, right? Our entry level courses, they are going to max out at 36 students. You're not going to be in a classroom. You're not going to be in a lecture hall with, you know, 300 of your closest friends, right? You're going to have 36 students in there. The faculty are going to know you by name. We're going to interact with you. You can interact with us. We're going to have a variety of activities <clears throat> within those classrooms that allow you to do more than just listen passively, uh, but to, to work within that classroom setting. Our lab design, all of our labs are maxed out at 24 students, right? In both those lectures and the labs, and we'll see some of those lab spaces in just a minute, you are going to have a PhD professor, right? The College of Science and Mathematics at Belmont is 100% undergraduate. We do not have graduate programs, which means we do not have graduate students, which means that professors conduct all lectures and all labs. They grade all their own tests. They do all their own recitation sessions. All of it is run by my faculty, right? So it's a very, very good continuity and uh, it's a great learning environment. When you jump up to the upper level courses, <coughs> excuse me, I'm so sorry. <coughs> there we go, to the upper level courses. We're gonna max those courses out at 24 students. So especially like in biology and chemistry, a lot of the times you are in a lab space, but it's also your lecture space, right? So uh, those rooms are set up to hold 24 people. By OSHA's rules, I cannot put more than 24 people in there. And so again, it's, it's a great learning environment. All of that uh, uh, leading you towards earning that, that higher uh, GPA. Now, there are aptitude tests, right? So a lot of you are thinking, you know, the ACT, the SAT, that sort of thing. There's another level. We've got the MCAT, the PCAT, the OAT, which is for uh, optometry school. Uh, there's a number of these different uh, uh, tests that happen while you're an undergraduate. My message to you right now, don't even worry about these things, right? What I want you to do is I want you to focus in on, um, the, your GPA, right? I don't want you worrying about your aptitude test, right? That test happens, depending on your timeline, it could happen at the end of your junior year. It could happen at the end of your sophomore, I'm sorry, senior year, not your sophomore year, end of your junior year, end of your sophomore year. So about a year out, we start to employ some strategies. First three or four months, I just want you to get old used review books, just kind of thumb through them and get accustomed to how they present the material and how they ask the questions. Next three or four months, it starts by taking a practice test. We need that data. We need to know where you are and to try to compare yourself to the national average. It will also tell you where your weaknesses are. You know, what, what part of that test are you not quite prepared for? And we're going to focus on, in on that. Now, we're not going to exclude anything else, but we're really, really going to work hard on our weak areas about halfway through that three to four month period, we're gonna take another practice test. Again, what that does is it gives us more data. It lets us know again, a national you know, ranking or something to compare to the national ranking, but also to let us know is our study strategies or the study strategies that we're employing, are they working? If not, let's change it up. If they are, great, let's just keep working the way we're doing. End of that three or four months, take a third practice test, right? Just, add, just adding to that data pool, seeing if we are improving uh, the way that we should be improving. Next three or four months, right? We're leading up to the test, right? Really, really crank up your studying. You're probably talking about 12 to 15 hours a week. Really, really intensive study. At the end of that three to four months, we're going to take one more practice test, right? And make sure that we are where we need to be, that, that we are achieving that score um, that's going to be competitive. 
if we're not there, I, I will advise you, uh, you know, push that test off. It, it, it might it, it might mean a gap year for you. It might mean, you know, some alternative pathway for, for a short period of time. But you really, really want to put your best foot forward. And, and if that means holding off that test, that, that's what we'll end up doing. So those are the two objective things that we're interested in and, and really um, working to get those at the highest level that we possibly can. Now, that being said, it, it is more than that. It's more than just those objective scores. Uh, we want you to really become that, that full uh, applicant. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go over a few more things that will lead us to uh, being that, that truly strong applicant. The next thing that I really want you to work on is clinical exposure. This is essential, right? I need you to be able to do that. I would say that I want you to start now right? Start in your hometown, use family, friends, use your own physicians, your own clinicians, um, maybe church family, whatever, whoever you know that's working in a clinical area, I want you to go hang out with them. And I, and I want you to go really broad, right? Even though you may think, you know what, I want to be a psychiatrist, go hang out with a physical therapist and go hang out with a nurse. You know, my, my point is this, how do you know you don't want to be something else until you hang out with them, right? Go really, really broad, you know, ask them those really awkward questions like, what don't you like about your job? And the idea is, is that you're going to narrow your scope as you move along, right? There'll, there'll be things that you, that you, uh, um, uh, 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 that, that you are exposed to and you're just like, you know what, I just don't want to do that job. And that's fine, right? You're making that informed decision. Um, what I hope happens, right, is that as you move along, you journal these experiences, right? And, and the most important thing that you can write down uh, is what you learned. That's the most important thing. I mean, obviously, write down who you were with, where you were there, and how long you were there. But what did you learn? That is so, so important because that's what you're going to write about in your personal statements, that's what you're going to talk about when you go to interviews. That, that, that's what's so critical about that is, is what are you learning and, and how do you carry that forward? How, how would you utilize that once you become uh, that clinician that you want to be? So again, essential, go ahead and start now. We'll carry it forward through your four years here at Belmont and journal all of these experiences, right? Uh, whether it be in a hospital, whether it be in private practice, whether it be uh, with a nonprofit, whatever it is, uh, take the time to, to record that and, and truly, again, figure out what, what you learn from each situation and, and, and how that will make you a better clinician in the future. Next thing, right, research. As I mentioned earlier, my college does not have any graduate students. So all of the research opportunities, and again, we're gonna show you some research space here in just a few minutes, but all of that research opportunity that we have is dedicated to undergraduates. And we have students that are doing everything from cancer biology research to Parkinson's disease research, to developmental biology research, to uh, um, analytical chemistry, uh, to uh, inorganic synthetic chemistry. I mean, we run the gamut. We do a really, really high level of, of research um, for the undergraduate. My dean, my boss, right, he talks about that we do graduate level work, but at an undergraduate pace. And so it, it's really exciting. It, it's, it's really cool. Again, we'll show you some of the stuff, uh, some of the spaces that we have here in just a few minutes. What do you get out of that research, right? One of the biggest things that you are going to develop are your problem solving skills. That is hugely important. That, that ability to do critical thinking, that, that's what we want you to be able to do. Now, why is that so important? It is important, one, because it is a soft skill that you will use at all levels of your life, inside your job, outside your job, at multiple jobs. It doesn't make any difference. Almost every position that you hold will require, will require critical thinking skills, that ability to solve problems, right? And we want you to practice that in research, right? That's what you do, right? You run into problems, you think your way through them, and you move that research forward. That, that's what that is so important about. Now, in addition to those problem solving skills, you are going to learn uh, how to work in a team. No research is done in isolation. And finally, you're also going to learn how to do communication, right? Oral and written communication. Again, a soft skill that's going to be beneficial no matter where you end up. 
we really, really want you to practice those uh, communication skills at regional and national meetings, right? We typically pay for about 100 to 115 students to go to these regional and national meetings, right? So I'm gonna say that again, we pay for that. We pay for your, uh, um, your flights, we pay for your registration, we pay for your hotel rooms, we cannot pay for your food for some odd reason, but we're going to send you to these conferences so that you can present your original research, right? And, and that's what's so fantastic, right? Is that you are, you are driving this forward. Now, <clears throat> we have research all year long, but I will say the majority of our students are going to do or engage in research during the summer. We'll, we'll have about a 10th to uh, uh, a 20th of the, um, of the uh, um, students, uh, students here in the College of Science and Math doing research. We have two summer programs, one is a what we call summer scholars. It is a 10 week program. You get six weeks of research credit that you can count towards your major, uh, or I'm sorry, six hours of research credit that you count towards your major. You generally pay for two, so we run it at a discount. We also have what is called SURF's Summer Undergraduate Research Fellowship. In that case, we're gonna pay you to come and do research. It is a six week program. We give you a free dorm room and we pay you $1,800 um, it's not a ton of money. It's not truly a salary. It's a stipend. But again, you have that opportunity to get engaged in research, to explore different areas of science, and to start practicing those skills that are so important, right? So again, uh, research, even though we are a teaching university, we want you to engage in that uh, as early as possible. The last two things that I'm going to point out and talk about are leadership and philanthropy. Now, you can develop leadership skills in lots of different areas. It can be on campus, it can be off campus, though I will say the majority of my students are going to use student clubs and organizations here on campus to develop those leadership skills. Now, a couple of things to say about that, right? First of all, we have about 160 student-led organizations here on campus. I need you in one, maybe two of those clubs. I don't need you in 10. I want you to be extremely active in whichever club you choose. So choose one you're passionate about, right? Choose wisely, find something that you're really, really engaged with and push that forward, right? Become a member of that. It could be health related. It could not be health related. It doesn't make a difference, okay? Second thing is you do not have to be in that executive committee to learn leadership skills, right? It, that's, that's a misconception. A lot of people think, oh, well, I better be president or VP or secretary or something to develop leadership skills. You can be, you don't have to be. So the question becomes, right? Well, if I'm not in that executive committee, how do I develop those leadership skills? And I point to this philanthropy, right? I need you to be a very empathetic person, not a sympathetic person, right? Empathy, right? What, what that means is, is that you are able to put yourself in the place of that person and understand where their feelings are coming from, where their thoughts are coming from, right? And one of the best ways to develop that is through philanthropy, through giving back to the community. So this is what I hope happens, right? You come to Belmont, you get yourself settled, and then you turn your eyes away from campus and you're gonna find a nonprofit that needs help. You gotta to go to them. You have to ask them two questions, you know, what do you need and how can we get it to you, right? You're gonna take that discussion back to your student group, right? All of our student groups in their charter must do philanthropy. So you're gonna present this to the group and you're going to tell them this is a great opportunity and this is what this group needs and this is how we can get it to them. There'll be some give and take, but hopefully what happens is it becomes a group goal. When it becomes a group goal, right? Yeah, raise your hand and say, okay, this is our group goal. I want to lead it, right? And what you do, you take that goal and you uh, develop achievable action steps, right? Certain steps that you can do to develop a product, right? Which is giving back to this nonprofit. And what you have, right? You have concrete evidence of your leadership ability. And that's hugely, hugely important, okay? All right, so that was a whole lot of information in a short amount of time, right? We've got these objective things up there that we are gonna work on uh, through the three and a half years, four years that you're here in those classroom experiences. 
we have these subjective things that I, I want you to start now, right? I want you to figure out how to get those clinical work, uh, clinical exposures, how, you know, what, what area of research you might be interested in, though you're definitely welcome to explore once you get here, right? And then once you get here, develop those leadership skills. So again, very, very important things to work on. I, I can tell you this, it's not a guarantee. It, I, I can't tell you that you will definitely get into the graduate program that you wanna get into uh, when you wanna get into it, but I can tell you this, right? Our five-year average of getting into medical schools is 85%, right? The national average is 42%, so we double that. So that, that's good, that's fantastic. But I feel, and I'm, I'm gonna stop sharing this right now. I feel that one of the better statistics that I can share with you is the fact that our students get multiple acceptances to grad schools, right? Whether it's PT school or a, a PhD graduate program or medical school, our students get multiple acceptances. So what that means is you will have choices, right? What that tells me is, our students are competitive, competitive, right? They have that education, they have that knowledge, they have those experiences that make them competitive at the national level, right? And that, that's what's so, so important. Uh, I do wanna share, you know, probably the epitome of the, those multiple acceptances occurred about two years ago, right? I had a student, very, very good student. She's from Tennessee. She got into one of the Tennessee state schools, which was fantastic, but she also got into Tufts, she got into Brown, she got into Stanford, she got into UNC Chapel Hill, and she ended up going to Harvard, right? So she got into six medical schools. That tells me, right, she was extremely competitive as most of our students are as they um, come out of Belmont. Again, with that, those experiences and with that uh, knowledge. So again, I, I think we're doing some good stuff. I really, really, truly do think that we're doing some good stuff. Now, a good question becomes like, is, is where does this happen, right? So I'm gonna share my screen again. I'm gonna share something different, right? Okay, so what we have here are some virtual tours uh, of the spaces here at Belmont. So we did this, I don't know, two or three years ago. We basically created this, this virtual tour, this 3D uh, rendering of all of the lab spaces that we have. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna take a minute or two and we're gonna walk through some of these lab spaces uh, that we have. So first of all, I am a biologist, so um, I'm gonna cheat a little bit. I'm gonna to go to the biology labs, right? And so we're gonna click on that. And these are on our website. You can, you can, you can go to these anytime you want, right? And so what we're seeing here, uh, this, this is the atrium. Oh, I need to make this bigger. How do I make this bigger? There we go. There we go, full screen. Um, so um, th this is our atrium, right? This is the third floor of our um, math and science uh, uh, portion of the college, right? And so we have a lot of study rooms. There's a lot of study spaces uh, that you can get involved in, right? And I'm gonna go to a, what they call the floor plan. So this is an overhead view. And so we have a number of, of, of research spaces, but also of uh, uh, teaching spaces as well. So I'm gonna start out with the research spaces, right? I'm gonna dive into, well, I'm gonna try to dive into there. There we go. So this is one of our research spaces, right? And this, this room is dedicated more to like molecular and cellular biology. Uh, one of the uh, faculty members, Dr. Adams, uh, she is an alum of Belmont. She was working at Yale. We hired her back. Uh, she's in her second year and she does a fantastic job, right? She is so dedicated to teaching, uh, not only in the classroom, but in the research space. And what she's interested in is how do our cells process messenger RNA? I, I know that sounds like a simple question, but you know, we don't understand. We teach it as, okay, it's transcription, translation, done, you know, end of story, but that, that's not true. There's a lot to be learned about how messenger RNA is processed, she uses a yeast model uh, to uh, help us understand uh, that, that aspect of it. My students do their research in here, right? My, uh, my students are interested in um, Parkinson's disease, right? We're gonna walk through that, that, that thing. I love that part of it. Uh, I'm, I'm not gonna show you this right uh, on here, but this is a video of two of my uh, students who uh, did summer research with me. If I try to play it, it doesn't play really well on uh, trying to translate through Zoom. Uh, so I'm not gonna show it, but it is there, right? You can go listen to um, 
Landon is on the left, Aaron is on the right, right? Aaron just uh, got uh, accepted into uh, medical school. So I'm really excited for him. Uh, Landon is uh, still an undergraduate, still, still working uh, his way through that process, right? We're gonna come back out, right? I'm gonna dive over here. This right here is our cell culture room. Uh, very, very interesting. You do what you think you would do in a cell culture room, right? You grow cells. And some of the uh, uh, cells that we grow are utilized by Dr. Barton, right? He's a cancer biologist and his research component is looking to find alternatives to existing chemotherapies. He grows all types of cancer cells in here. These are some incubators uh, here in the middle. Uh, over here, we have some biosafety cabinets so we can uh, safely work with these cells. He's growing lung cancer cells. He's growing skin cancer cells. He's growing cervical cancer cells, uh, even colorectal uh, cancer cells. So all different types of, of, of uh, cancer cells. And he has determined that some existing medicines can serve as chemotherapies. One of the ones he's worked with a lot are uh, anti-malarial drugs. So real quick uh, biology lesson, malaria is a parasite. You get infected with a malarial parasite. It enters into your red blood cells and the parasite divides. The parasite divides almost the exact same way that our cells divide. Anti-malarial drugs prevent those parasites from dividing. So the question becomes, will anti-malarial drugs, which have far fewer side effects, will it work against cancer cells? And sure enough, it does, right? In, in a Petri dish. I mean, that's, that's a long way from, you know, using it against cancers, but promising. Dr. Barton has had three publications in the last four years on that subject. In all three of those publications, a student has been the first author, right? So you have the opportunity uh, to become a first author. Uh, go over here real quickly. Uh, this is actually one of my students uh, posters, right? Um, and so this right here is uh, one of the main outputs, right? Of a, uh, um, well, that's a teaching lab. Uh, one of the outputs of a uh, student's work, right? And, and this is part of, of not only that, that learning, that critical thinking, but also that, so that communication, right? And again, what would happen is that poster would be taken to a number of, um, uh, of, of student presentations, whether it be a regional and or a national. We're gonna go down the hallway just a bit, right? I wanna duck into, whoa, sorry about that. We're gonna duck into this lab right here. This is where our zebrafish colony lives, right? So there aren't any zebrafish in there right now. Oh, actually, no, I take that back. There are a few, right? There are a couple right there and then right there. Um, Dr. Glenn uh, is a developmental biologist and she worked uh, at St. Jude. So we hired her from St. Jude down in Memphis, and she is interested in how the spinal column develops. So not the cord, right, uh, but the spinal column. So the vertebra, the muscles, the ligaments, the tendons, those types of things. And so she's interested in two particular proteins. And what she'll do is she'll actually take zebrafish embryos that we grow here at Belmont, and she will knock out those proteins using molecular techniques and see how that affects development. So pretty interesting stuff, right? Pretty, pretty interesting stuff. Uh, before we go and go look at a different area, I do wanna to go to a teaching space, right? So I'm gonna dive into this room right here. This is an upper level lecture room, right? So if you look real quickly, there's one, two, three, four, five, six tabletops. There are four seats at each of those tables. So what that means is 24 students, right? Again, by OSHA's rules, I cannot put more than 24 students into this classroom. This particular classroom uh, is a lecture room. This is anatomy and physiology one lecture, but also anatomy and physiology one lab, right? And again, you see all the neat, uh, interesting toys. Let me, uh, let me spin you around right here. Uh, again, a lot of models, uh, a lot of uh, figures. Um, you can kind of see him right there. Uh, that is Otis, right? He is a real skeleton, right? So uh, he is an articulated skeleton. Those are real bones that we can utilize to help you learn uh, the human anatomy and physiology. Uh, I will reiterate with this particular class, AMP1, AMP2, my upper level general physiology class, neurobiology, a, a few more other courses, you will have the opportunity to go into our cadaver lab. So uh, we typically have 16 individuals who will themselves to our program. 
We do not do the dissections. You are not forced to go. It is an opportunity to go if you want to go uh, and interact uh, with the cadaver. Um, great, great learning experience. The majority of undergraduates never get that opportunity. So uh, that's exciting, right, that, that you would have that opportunity. All right, so that being said, right, I want to go um, upstairs to the chemistry physics area. Again, I wanna to go to full screen. We're gonna start out again in the atrium, right? So we're up on the fourth floor. Uh, we were down on the third floor. Again, a lot of, of posters, a lot of, of um, research opportunities. Well, come on, there we go. So it's lagging on me just a little bit. So uh, we're gonna jump into this classroom first. This is the organic chemistry synthesis lab, right? So that dreaded organic chemistry, uh, I will be honest, I loved organic chemistry. It was one of my favorite classes. I, I just enjoyed it so much. Um, I, I could visualize it. It, it, it. I'm a very visual learner and it just helped, I, it, it helped me to, to, to go through organic chemistry. Um, in this particular lab, what you're doing is you are synthesizing carbon-based molecules. Quick spoil, spoiler alert, um, in this, you're either going to make a white powder or you're going to make a yellow oil, right? And so the question becomes, okay, did I truly make, you know, if, if I'm trying to make salicylic acid, right, which is, is the active ingredient in aspirin, did I truly make what I, what I thought that I made, right? And so what you quickly do is you come into this uh, lab space. This is an analytical uh, lab space. And so we have on this side of the room, a number of boxes that are going to allow you to do different chromatography techniques. Um, we can do it in the gaseous phase, we can do it in the liquid phase. This is one of our older HPLCs, high performance liquid chromatography. We have a brand new one. Uh, that one, that, that equipment's not even there. Um, we have a, a new and exciting one that does it an even better job. This, uh, these will allow you to get different information or pure samples of your uh, um, uh, product that you're trying to, to look at. You come over to these boxes and what you're gonna do is you are going to uh, interrogate those different chemistry, uh, or, I'm sorry, different chemicals um, with different types of um, light, UV, uh, fluorescence, uh, um, infrared, that type of thing, right? We are going to go, I'm gonna try to go back here, there we go. So I'm gonna go into this space right here, uh, really, really exciting lab space. I'm gonna head over down here. This is an inorganic synthetic lab, right? This is Dr. Stace's lab really exciting in terms of he is trying to create molecules that will enhance uh, solar panels, right? A lot of people don't realize that the best commercial solar panel that we have right now is only about 22% efficient, right? So 22% of the time is capturing a photon that is then going to move electrons, right? Generate electricity. So what Dr. Stace wants to do is increase that efficiency. So I don't know if you can see it, but you see these molecules that are right there, kind of the colored, the bluish purplish. Uh, what he's actually doing is he is creating molecules that mimic chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is the end all be all of a molecule that can capture photons of light and generate energy, right? So we wanna mimic that and create those molecules that will make those solar panels that much more efficient. I'm gonna jump back out to the floor plan, right? Um, we're going to head over to another uh, research space. So this research sp space right here, another uh, lab, uh, uh, chemistry analytical lab, some really high end spectrophotometers. Um, we're not seeing it right there. We, this is all cleaned up right now, but Dr. Spence, who's the Dean of the uh, college, he is a, a physical chemist and one of the things that he has done, I don't have it in front of us right now, but he has actually created a device that will detect lead in soil and even in water, right? To be able to detect lead in water, you need to build a device that will detect lead at 15 parts per billion. He has worked over the past three years with his students, right? His students are doing the, the bulk of the work. And they have created a, a device. It costs about $120, $130, and it can detect lead at two parts per billion. I mean, that, that's absolutely amazing. And the idea is that this is going to be a deployable device, right? We can give it to high school students, and they can either build the device or just utilize the devices that we create, and they can learn um, 
uh, electronics. They can learn some computer programming. They can learn some analytical chemistry. It is a multi-use device in terms of education. And it's just really exciting that Dr. Spence's students um, have been able to do that. We have a number of other things, uh, uh, teaching spaces and research spaces, right? I'm gonna dive into here. This is a physics lab, right? Uh, so this is where you learn Newtonian mechanics, where you learn uh, uh, electronics, where you learn uh, wave, the physics of waves, uh, everything from sound waves to water waves and everything in between. Uh, so again, uh, some really, really good uh, teaching spaces uh, that, where you learn skills, right? And, and all of our labs, that's what you're doing. You're learning a set of skills uh, that you can utilize uh, later on. All right. I am going to jump out of chem physics, right? And I am going to go into the psychological sciences. So this is in a slightly different area of the campus. Again, I'm gonna go into full view. Um, this is where psychology and neuroscience are located. Um, it's kind of interesting to have psychology with a uh, natural science uh, college, but they are so empirical that it makes sense that they are with us, right? Again, we're just seeing some uh, uh, hangout spaces, right? A lot of students hang out there and, and, and do a number of things. We're gonna dive into this classroom. This is your typical classroom. Again, 24 students, right? And what's, what's exciting about this, again, is, is, is the engagement that can occur, right? Uh, we have, a, a, again, a number of toys that we can utilize from sensory deprivation uh, for rodents, uh, to um, being able to um, uh, learn about uh, behavior, animal behavior, not only by looking at how they learn, but also looking at the neurons, right? We actually are able to extract uh, the brains of rodents and actually slice those brains so that we can see new neuron development and, and how that is influenced by stress, how that is influenced by uh, team learning. Again, just, just a number of things. On the wall, what you're seeing are the, those student products, those student posters that, again, uh, have been uh, presented at a number of uh, um, national and even some international um, uh, presentations, uh, meetings. This, in this area, these are more of the cognitive psychology areas, right? Uh, so driving simulations, uh, VR, not a lot of research has been done on virtual reality. And so, you know, what is your perception of virtual reality? How does it affect you physiologically? You know, uh, how do you think under these different interactions, right? Um, Dr. Uh, Jones, who is the chair of that department, she was doing immersive uh, exercise, the psychology of immersive exercise long before Peloton had the idea, right? And so what we'll do is we can move uh, this treadmill over here, close the screens and put you in an immersive environment. And again, not only look at you cognitively, but look at you physiologically and see uh, how that affects you. I'm gonna jump out of this. I wanna show you um, one of the spaces, right? Th this, this is the student lounge, right? Of the psychology and neuroscience uh, uh, area. Uh, all of these spaces, these are faculty offices. So I wanna show you how accessible our faculty are. And again, this mimics all of the, the different uh, office suites that we have, biology, chemistry, physics, math, all of them look very similar. All of our faculty have eight hours of office hours every week so that you can pop into their office and interact with them, whether it be review, uh, talk about your plan of study, uh, talk about your career, right? Again, just a number of, 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 of highly uh, engageable faculty members. Um, I do wanna point out, because we have uh, the psych high poster here on the, on the wall, we have a number of honor societies uh, that you can get involved with, uh, Tri Beta and, um, in uh, biology, psychi and neuroci, uh, in um, psychology, neuroscience, uh, SACS uh, in chemistry physics. So again, a number of places that you can get uh, involved in. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Man, that was, <laughs> that was a whirlwind. So I, I hope that you are getting the idea that Belmont does science at a really high level we dedicate our science capabilities to the undergraduates. We have faculty dedicated to your learning, not only in the classroom, but in the research areas as well. 
basically we want you to succeed. We want you to do well. Uh, we want to get to know you, uh, which helps a ton in terms of writing those letters of recommendation. And yeah, I, I want y'all to come visit us, right? That That's the best thing that you can do. We are running live um, uh, tours every day. We're running two tours a day. We are doing preview days in person. You have to sign up for all of this. You can do that on the admissions website. But I really want you to come and, and experience all of this for our, for yourselves. It'll be myself or Dean Spence or both of us running, running the tour groups. Uh, I'm sure that you will be interacting with um, Libby Sefferson. She is our recruiting expert. And yeah, engage with us, right? Uh, ask us questions and, and uh, help us uh, uh, help you make that that decision uh, for where you want to uh, make that, you know, that that next four year home uh, as you as you move on into undergraduate. So I hope this is helpful. Um, yeah, reach out to us. And uh, thanks so much. I do appreciate it.